Three, two, one. Chair, we are live. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the January 19, 2022 Community Formation Commission meeting. We'll call the meeting to order at 5.35. And Sam, if you can do a roll call, please. Yes, uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, Commissioner Demo Adam Lakin. Commissioner Alonzo. Here. Commissioner Chavez. Here. Chair Escobedo. Here. Commissioner Kim Johnson. Here. Commissioner Rachel Johnson. Here. Commissioner Killebrew. Oh, I Here. I saw, there he is. Commissioner Rodriguez. Here. Commissioner Sander. Here. Commissioner Wood. Here. Vice Chair Zabeta. Here. And Commissioner Reno. Here, sir. We have full quorum. Thank you, Sam. So we'll move on to the next item, and that is public comment for items unrelated to anything on our agenda for today. Sam, do we have anyone from the public that would like to give public comment today? Let me find out. If there's anyone in the public that would like to speak on an item not on the agenda, please raise your hand in the Zoom platform. If there's anyone in the public that would like to speak on an item not on the agenda, please raise your hand in the Zoom platform. There are no hands raised. Thank you. So that takes us to item four, which is the administrative agenda. And we'll start with announcements. And really the only announcement that we have is uh, if you have not entered your presentations onto the Google Sheet that Louisa set up, then make sure to do that and we will provide an update uh, next week for all of the presentations done and then uh, what presentations we have on the horizon. So if you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out. And with that, we'll move to item B. 4B, which is consideration and action on the draft Community Formation Commission meeting minutes for January 12, 2022. Are there any edits to the meeting minutes? I'm not seeing any. So do I have a motion to approve? So moved. Second. We have a motion from Christian, a second from Jordan. Any discussion? I'm not seeing any. Sam, can we do a roll call vote, please? Sure, let me just open up to the public comment first. Thank you. If there's anyone that'd like to speak on the consideration of meeting minutes from January 12th, please raise your hand. There are no hand raised, so I will take a roll. Um, there's been a motion by Commissioner Alonzo, seconded by Commissioner Killebrew to approve the meeting minutes of January 12th, 2022 as presented. Commissioner Alonzo? Aye. Commissioner Chavez? Yes. Chair Escobedo? Yes. Commissioner Kim Johnson? Yes. Commissioner <clears throat> Rachel Johnson? Yes. Commissioner Killebrew? Yes. Commissioner Rodriguez? Yes. Commissioner Sander? Yes. Commissioner Wood? Yes. Vice Chair Zapeta? And Commissioner Reynaud? Yes. Motion passes. Thank you. So we'll close out item four and we will move on to item five, which is a continued item from last week's meeting. Uh, and I'll read it into the record. It's a continued item, discussion and review of civilian oversight board draft language for the oversight model. This item is a continued discussion from the January 12th CFC meeting to discuss and review the draft recommendation for the review board portion of the oversight model. The CFC may take action on approving part or all of the language for the purposes of later making a recommendation to the city council. So before we jump into it, just as a reminder of what the format will be and, and what the goal of tonight is, uh, the goal is to complete the review board portion of the model. So if we can do that, we are well on our way to being on track to having our recommendation, recommendation done or the draft recommendation done by the end of the month. So in order to make sure that we're um, staying on task, just a couple of uh, housekeeping items. We're gonna have the same format as, as last week where 
we are going to go section by section um, from the suggestions and the feedback that we got last week. So we, we're going to start back at the beginning of the document and work our way through. Um, then uh, at each section, we're going to check in with staff with both John Doimus and uh, Lieutenant Sean Hill just to see if they have any feedback on each of those sections. Uh, and then we'll, we'll work our way through the document. So I anticipate we'll get through the first portion pretty quickly since um, they were some small edits from last week, but we did add some stuff based on comments that we had heard and concerns raised. If uh, we end up getting stuck on one portion, we might um, interject and go to a straw poll vote just so that we can keep this uh, pretty efficient tonight and, and make our way through the end of the document. Um, I think that is everything. And so with that, I will turn it over to Kami. Thank you, Gabe. So as Gabe um, said, we're gonna start at the beginning. Um, based on um, last week's conversation, comments that were made, um, I have gone through the document and made some suggested changes and you will see all of those in um, green on the screen. Um, I, I realized that most of you got this this afternoon. I don't know if you've been able to read through the changes thoroughly. There aren't a ton of them, but I, I do wanna give you each time in each of the sections to respond to them, to let me know how you feel about them. Um, if everybody's okay with them, we will accept them and move on to the next se section. So I wanna start with um, the introduction. Um, last week when we were talking, there was were some comments um, that came about about um, police, uh, the, the, the genesis of this effort um, and about using the word collaboration in this opening session section. Um, so does anybody have any comments on any of this? Jordan, I saw your hand up. Did you mean uh, to lower it? I'm sorry, I just didn't want to make sure I don't pass over you. Uh, no, no worries. This, uh, this looked good on my end. My only comment is that um, when we use Santa Barbara Police Department, that we actually put SPPD in parentheses after that, um, okay. because then we go in and out of using SPPD. Um, and some of my comments are going to be, I read through it this afternoon, and some of my comments will be along um, just keeping that same kind of standard. Um, I do comms and marketing in my day job, so. No, I appreciate right, it. I apologize in advance. <laughs> <laughs> bring it, bring it on, Jordan. It's fine. I appreciate it. Anything else? Okay, great. So let's um, move on. Know all of this about uh, members, partners, all of that stayed the same. Jordan? Sorry, another, is Anna a co-chair or a vice chair? Ah, uh, that's a good question. I don't, I don't know the answer to that. She's vice chair, um, members of the commission. Thank you, Sam. And then additionally, I think um, it's interim police chief Bernard Malikian. Um, yep. If we're also doing like little edits like that too, I was curious because Anna's uh, hyphenated last name also might be out of alphabetical order. Okay. Anything else? Okay. Okay. The background section, nothing. We will, I will move, try to work on the formatting so that all of this, so Elise White's name shows up on the previous page. But as far as background is concerned, nothing here changed.
Okay. Um, nothing changed in the civilian oversight model recommendation piece. Actually, um, there was one thing that um, where the bullet points are. The third bullet point um, builds build relationship between SVPD and larger community. I, I think I prefer for it to say strengthen because there are relationships already built, but I think we need to strengthen those relationships. Okay. Everyone can always strengthen those relationships. Yeah, I had that same comment. I had enhance um, or something like that, but I think either one works. Yeah, thank you, Lizzie. Okay. Yeah, but I also think like, if you're suggesting that like the relationships don't need to be built, I think that that would be an error too. So I would recommend build and enhance or enhance and build. Any comments on that? Does, I, does anybody else feel that it needs to have build as well? Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and put strengthen in here. Okay, perfect. And then I see some just small editing things through there, semicolons, periods, things like that, that we'll clean up as well. And I feel certain, Rachel, you probably already have them on your radar. <laughs> I do too. <laughs> I can see you guys we're gonna, are both we're the first. We're gonna see faces <laughs> on my screen. I'm like they're they're just waiting. Um, yes, yeah, Chief, I see your hand raised. Yes, thank you. A, a point of clarification: There's a phrase that's used in this portion of the document that doesn't get used hardly anywhere else, and it refers to a Department of Police Oversight. Department has connotations uh, with respect to city government. It doesn't seem to be in alignment with uh, anything that's generally suggested. So I would suggest taking a look at that. Thank you for bringing that up. We had actually gone through and tried to find everywhere that it said department and change it to office um, so that it was more kind of accurately reflected the entity itself that was being formed. Um, and so I will uh, make a note to go through and make sure to get rid of that everywhere else that it did not get removed. Thank you, Cami. I was I was confused because halfway through the document it started saying OPO, and then I was very I was confused. And you were like, what, what happened to DPO? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Piece, sorry about that. Piece. I thought that I had gotten all of them, and apparently I did not. So I will definitely go back and fix that. Okay, so um, the next changes or suggested edits um, happen in the, the purpose statement actually, and just some um, really just kind of moving some wording around. So I wanted to take a moment and see what everybody's reaction to that was. Jordan. All right, I keep on taking up space. Um, I, I didn't know the word promoting kind of sticks out to me, to be completely honest, um, as I think as a subset of the work of what this body will be doing, it kind of will, but I don't see it as actively going out and promoting the Santa Barbara Police Department. Or maybe there's clarification here. I'm just curious on that word choice. Because I do believe that it will help build, you know, or help um, in building public trust between the community and SBPD, but the promoting part is, seems odd. Commissioner, um, I'm reading it as promoting transparency. I see the new edit. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, that makes sense. So you're good with that, Jordan? Okay. Anything else? Sean, John, I wanna make sure that you also feel like you can jump in as well. If you have any 
comments. Okay, so let's move on. Um, the next um, change that we have, let's move down to section B, which is about the composition qualifications and disqualifications for membership. So um, there are probably, there are a, a couple things in here that were changed um, based on comments. One of the things was that co conversation about youth and adding more specificity, even though, a court, I mean, with city and the way that things are, are commissions are appointed, someone that was 13 wouldn't be appointed to a commission. But just adding clarification that when we're talking about youth in the sense that it's ages 18 to 24. Um, and then that's, that is the only change I had made based on comments. I do know that based on comments at the last meeting, Rachel, before I go on, go ahead, Rachel. Oh, no, no, you can finish that. But... Well, no, I, I, oh, I would okay. rather you go. I don't want to take um, up more space than I, I need. I just, to. I just had another uh, note in this section that we were going to consider adding reference to like charter language, like, like what would have been the standard things like, um, right. Cause we had talked about how any, any city charters would require like over the age of 18 or something. Um, and I wasn't sure if we were actually just going to reference other, we don't have to list it all out, but just reference the city, like the existing city criteria mm -hmm. in some way. Okay. And maybe John, I don't know if John wants to suggest maybe what that could be just a quick reference to the fact that we're obviously also going to have to, you know, include any other city charter um, restrictions or guidelines. Thank you, Rachel. John, do you do you want to respond to that or add anything to that? I apologize. I'm on my way home. <laughs> I should be home in 10 minutes. So I'm driving in the car. Uh, what was the, the question on the last part? I apologize for that. Rachel, do you want to repeat your comment? Do you mind? No, not at all. Um, John, we were just wondering if in the section where we're discussing the, um, the requirements for who could be on the commission, um, huh? do, is there a way to reference existing city guidelines that every commission follows? Um, for, yeah, for sure, that's, that's a really good question, Commissioner Johnson and Commission. So uh, generally charter commissions follow the city charter, which, uh, uh, and, 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 and charter commissions are the ones already existing on the city charter. So examples are the planning commission, fire and police, uh, uh, civil service commission, uh, you know, those, all those are from the charters. There's a lot of other commissions and the vast majority of the commissions uh, we have or boards aren't necessarily in the charter, but those reference, there's one section in the city charter that references the qualifications, right? And the qualifications is that you must be uh, an elector of the city, meaning you must be uh, a city resident and must be over the age of 18 years old to qualify. So if you don't live within the city limits uh, or you're under the age of 18, um, you, you can't qualify to serve on, on a commission. So if you were wanting those to be the requirements, uh, then, then um, we could reference the section in the city charter uh, that makes it so. Uh, if, if you want to have, uh, if you want to go beyond those requirements, then I suggest uh, making a recommendation uh, uh, for the qualifications to be in a separate, for example, municipal code section or whatever it may be. Uh, for the qualifications you want. So, um, and each, com each commission is different. So charter commissions already have one reference point and those are kind of the main two uh, qualifications for it, or, or it could be separate. This commission is the perfect example when council put it together, um, you know, they, they wanted to draw from a wide, a wide segment of the community so they, they went beyond that. So it's up to the commission to decide what recommendation uh, on that aspect, but we basically have one, uh, which is in the charter um, for, for qualifications. Rachel? I just, I just had a quick follow-up because I, th I, I think I want to understand more um, because we had 
we had previously decided that eligibility would include um, people who live or work within the city limits. And if I'm understanding the existing charter, it actually, you have to live within the city limits. So are we allowed to expand that? Yes, yeah, so, you know, if, if this is not gonna be a, uh, a charter commission or we're not gonna reference, yeah, you're, okay. you're, allowed, you're allowed to expand that. So Perfect. You, can, you. you can either choose as a reference point or decide to go to go beyond that. And then if, if you do, I wouldn't recommend referencing a charter like on that aspect. Uh, okay, okay. Thank you for that, John. Lizzie? Uh, if, we, if we're not gonna um, reference the charter, then never mind. Okay. Okay, I feel like I can get rid of this comment now that I better understand that. Okay, perfect. Thank you for asking that question, Rachel. That's helpful that we all better understand that now. And thank you, John, for explaining it. Okay, anything else on the, um, the, the youth piece in this first paragraph? Okay. The other thing about, so let's um, go down a little bit further. Okay. The next thing that um, was done is that at our last meeting, um, John had said that we did not have to have anything in there about confidentiality agreements um, because this is actually something that confidentiality is a matter of them following all legal procedure. So not necessary to put in the recommendations. Um, anything else from this section that anybody wants to, to talk about, Gabe? Yeah, uh, thanks, Tammy. The only part that I think would be worthwhile revisiting now that we have the full text and context for what the review board will look like is this membership question. And I, <clears throat> I say that because I know a couple of commissioners have um, had discussions with me about how tough that particular conversation was when we had it and how close the vote was that it might be a good idea to revisit this. Um, and then in addition, it was also brought up la at last week's meeting. And I think it would be worthwhile bringing it up with the commission again to get a temperature check if we still agree with this language before we go out to public outreach with the draft recommendation or if we um, want to make changes. So I just want to throw that out there and open up that conversation if we can. Thanks, Gabe. Um, Chief, I see that your hand is raised. Yes, thank you. Before the discussion starts, I, I wanted to uh, try to convey maybe some clarification, clarifying language that might help in, in reviewing the discussion that took place. And I bet um, I do find this language, I, I think, problematic. But the, the, the discussion seemed to be around whether or not this section meant that a law enforcement representative would be serving on the board. Uh, and And I think the I think the confusion may be that the, and the discussion turned to, well, the department will have a liaison or have a representative there and that's the representative uh, and that therefore that purpose has been served. And I would just suggest for the purposes of discussion that the person who's the liaison from the police department is representing the police department in whatever the issue is that's in front of the commission. They are, they, they are tasked with, with explaining the department's position. A person with lived experience as a law enforcement officer who is no longer serving, who has no uh, vested interest in the Santa Barbara Police Department per se, I think brings a perspective to the board uh, or to, uh, yeah, to the board uh, in the same way that a person who has experienced homelessness or a person who has uh, been experienced 
has experience with the criminal justice system does. And so I, I would just ask that you carefully sort of reconsider this language because it's, it's somewhat exclusionary. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Chief. Any additional comments? I'm just curious, is, is all of our, are all of our commissioners here today? Is there anyone not present to be to participate in this discussion? The, the only commissioner absent is Commissioner Adam Malikum. Rachel? Um, yeah, I, I guess I just, uh, before we, I guess, jump into discussion, I just want to um, be clear about what we're asking. So, because um, at the last meeting, we also talked about how this is definitely a section that we want um, very intentionally to solicit community feedback through the surveys and the focus groups. Um, and so the, the new working group um, chatted about this as well and is sort of strategizing how, how best to make sure we, we get that kind of feedback from the community. Um, but for tonight, Gabe, are you asking us, basically, do we wanna change any of this language prior to that so that what the community is presented with uh, might, is, is, is different language than what's up here now, rather than waiting till after the community engagement portion to change it? Correct, yeah. Do we wanna, do we wanna change this language now? And I think given um, where we're at now compared to where we were, the last time we had this conversation, and you add the fact that we had quite a few commissioners miss that meeting, and it was a very, very close vote that I think it would be a good idea for us to discuss. Thank you, Lizzie. So as most of you know, I attended the NACO conference um, in Arizona last December, and one of the recommendations that I learned from the conference was that we wanna make sure that we have um, good collaborative relationship and support from the police union and from the, the police department. And uh, one of the ways that a uh, oversight commission can do that is by um, allowing one appointed seat um, to be granted to the police union or the chief themselves. And this um, doesn't have to be a sworn, well, they actually recommended that it wasn't a current sworn officer of that department, but somebody that they felt, um, and this isn't the, the liaison, this is just a person that they felt would um, uh, give them a sense of trust and um, validity in, in the processes. And if one of the things we want to um, display or to, to actually do is procedural justice, this allows those entities to, to have trust in that process. Thank you, Lizzie. Lewis? Uh, just like to say, uh, first of all, I agree with the Chief, obviously. Uh, as most of you know, I was a former police officer in Oakland, California. Um, haven't walked the beat since 1990. That's when I left. And um, I, I didn't know if I was going to initially get on this commission. I was probably the last alternate and barely got on here. And I know people feel very funny about that, me being here sometimes. And that's why I don't say very much. But I would just like to add for all of you who I've gotten to know a little bit, I just think it's a valued perspective to hear. And um, not that I'm any valuable, but I just think it's a valuable perspective to have. And if it is a collaboration we're looking for and trust and building those relationships, if it's everything we say we're gonna do, then I would think we would consider that perspective. Thank you. Thank you, Lewis. Rich? Yeah, um, so I, I still feel fairly strongly about this language staying in this uh, current, uh, as it's currently written, mainly because I, I, I do not doubt that there are uh, a lot that people can bring uh, to the board having served. Um, but if we, I, I think what, what we talked about was if this was supposed to be an independent body, the way that you make it truly independent is by not allowing 
current or former law enforcement serving on the board. Um, and I, 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 I don't see that as being, uh, if, if you really want to make a limit on how long, if somebody hasn't served in 10 years or something and you wanna do that, but I, I, I think like the, the point is that we want some, something that's independent of current law enforcement. And I, I, I don't know if some, depending on when somebody has left the beat and when they'd be on this, I, I think could be uh, problematic as if we have people that are there. Um, and in regard to what Lizzie had shared, I, I actually don't believe that we should have a member of the police or the police union on this board. I think it should be an independent body, period. So that's where I stand. Thank you. Thank you, Rich. Gabe? Thank you. Um, I just wanted to voice that I would be, I, I'm not in favor of supporting an appointee of this body from the police union or the Santa Barbara Police Department. But the same that I argued when we pre previously had this discussion is having a person with law enforcement experience previously with that lived experience could add a lot of perspective. My um, my perspective is colored with the fact that I've, I've had the opportunity to talk to Lewis and um, despite what you might say, Lewis, I think you had a lot. Uh, and I've, I've really appreciated that perspective. And I think it could be powerful for something like this. I strongly believe that it should be limited. And I think it should be no more than one. And if you have no more than one member with uh, my, and I'll just advocate for what I, what I think it should be is no more than one. Um, they have to be retired for a certain length of time and they couldn't have worked in Santa Barbara County. And I think that's, that's fair. It, limits the influence and I understand why um, some might think that might infringe on the independence, but uh, I think it could add some value. It's not saying that there has to be one person with uh, lived experience of being a law enforcement officer, but uh, it's saying that there's a possibility of that one person so long as they haven't worked in Santa Barbara County. So. Um, yeah, just wanted to voice that. Thank you for that, Gabe. Rachel? Um, let, let Serafina go first. Okay. Serafina? <laughs> thank you, Rachel. Um, I just wanted to say, th um, first of all, like, thank you, Lewis. I think from the conversations and the, being in the subcommittee with you, like, you have a great, great perspective. Um, and I've learned so much from you. Um, so please keep speaking up because it, it is really valuable and, and that's why you're here. Um, but I also wanted to say, I am still with Rich on this one. Um, I keep going back to what we said um, for our, our introduction, um, but also like the purpose of this, and that is really independent civilian oversight. Um, and that civilian and independent is kind of what keeps coming back to me is like, if we have a position, even if it's just one um, of either a current or former police officer, it's, it's, it contradicts with that. Um, so again, I'm still thinking I'm, you know, could be open to considering what Gabe had suggested um, of, you know, haven't worked in Santa Barbara County and, has been retired for a certain amount of years, I'm still open to considering that, but I'm definitely leaning more towards this is an independent board. I don't, at the moment, I don't think that it should have a member of the police department on it, um, but that's kind of where I'm at at the moment, um, is just thinking about that. But I think getting community feedback on this might also be very helpful. Um, so I, I would love to wait on that, but I also am comfortable showing this to the community as it is. Thank you, Serafina. Rachel? Um, yeah, thank you for that, Serafina. That's a great reminder to us all as well that like uh, 
you know, Cami as, as the person who's helping us get NACOL facilitators for those focus groups, like this is all, you know, great that we're saying this now because that means, you know, this is something that um, those facilitators can help us get at from the community. So um, just to add a couple things, yeah, I, um, I also, yeah, want to um, just express I'm, I'm a, would be uncomfortable with, with any kind of like appointed situation, um, even if, you know, that has uh, proven to work in other communities like that, that seems, I guess, I mean, on some level unnecessary if we're going to have a, or if the oversight body is going to have a liaison for SPPD, um, which I think, right, is very useful, um, but is a separate role in a lot of ways that I'm not sure, um, you know, having someone on the commission that's also appointed or somehow by the, by the PD, I don't know if that would really foster that trust that, that's really at the heart of this. Um, in, in terms of changing the language though, that is something I'm, I think I am in favor of uh, before putting it out to the community just because we wanna have you know, these conversations come up in focus groups. So um, I wanna propose, I liked um, Chief Malekian's language about lived experience because I think we've, we've used that in other places um, to really uplift the fact that we want the commission to be inclusive of you know, folks with lived experience of being disproportionately impacted by law enforcement or by um, you know, systems impacted individuals, um, folks with lived experience of, of houselessness, things like that. Um, so I think you know, in a way that that is fair to maybe consider that language here. Um, I think in Language is definitely important, and I think you know independent civilian oversight I, I, is something I'm 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 tripping up over that language as well. Um, I think independent is a tough word because to me that just means independent from SVPD, right? Not in I mean independent. I don't know what it means beyond independent from the police department that it's overseeing. Um, so I don't think it has to be independent from every other police department and, and someone that might have worked at in a different place. Um, so I don't know, I guess I would just sort of challenge us to keep thinking about that language because I think also one of our values is that this oversight body would be collaborative. So right, independent of SPED, but collaborative of and with all the stakeholders that we want to consider. Um, and maybe the same with civilian. I don't know enough about law enforcement and military careers to know, you know, at what point does someone become a civilian again? But I think they do become a civilian again after a certain amount of time or after a certain kind of lived experience, right? I mean, if, if um, like we said, like we have Lewis as a commissioner who has his own, you know, very interesting particular story about his, you know, lived experience as law enforcement. Um, so, I'd be curious, actually, Lewis, if you think of yourself as a civilian now, like if that if that word is as meaningful, I guess, as maybe we're we're giving it meaning here. So, um, all that to say, I think I'm I'm leaning in the middle, <laughs> like so, um, with with kind of Gabe's take in that I I like the idea of leaving the language a little more open, but imposing things like a limit um, if we're going to have a retired. Someone, someone with previous past experience, it needs to be not Santa Barbara County. I like the specificity of county because I don't think, I don't think a retired SB sheriff, you know, would be appropriate. Um, and the idea of, yeah, coming up with kind of a, a year or some sort of uh, distance between that lived experience and serving on the commission. So I'd be open, yeah, to, to changing it in that sense. And then also seeing what we get from the community, right? Like this is, I'm sure gonna be just as interesting of a conversation with um, the folks that we're gonna be putting this out to. Thank you, Rachel. Lizzie? Um, yes, I just wanted to clarify that I didn't suggest that current um, sworn or any employee of SBPD have a spot, I, that that's, I think that would just be a huge conflict of interest. But what I am saying, or what I was suggesting is that it was recommended that you want to have a, a, a collaborative relationship and having an appointed 
seat is one way to do it. And that's a very different role than a liaison. Um, I think maybe, maybe limiting instead of um, any law enforcement background, maybe specific to SBPD or, um, and, and we could say the sheriffs, but this is, this is an SBPD oversight body. So it's specific to this agency. Um, and then, you know, just as a reminder, retired law enforcement is our community. They're part of our community. So we're not um, creating bridges and strengthening relationships if we continue to separate that out. So um, I think you all know that, you know, that I think it would be, it would be helpful and, um, and important and, um, and it would show a level of collaboration if we allow retired law enforcement to be on this commission. Thank you, Lizzie. Christian? Um, I'm gonna address the chair. Chair, I would motion that we take a straw poll. We've had this conversation a lot. I think it's a worthy debate to have, but um, in the interest of time, I think we should just move to a straw poll. Okay, um, I'm okay with that as long On as what I know question? Uh, yeah. Um, straw poll to like change language or not change language? Or sure. a straw poll on some specific thing. straw poll on leaving it the same as it is or changing it. Okay, I'm okay with that. Uh, but let's give one minute to any other commissioners that would like to weigh in, if there are any. Okay. Uh, oh, Louisa, Louisa has raised her hand. I don't want to take too much time. Um, this is something that I've uh, put a tremendous amount of thought into. I know we all have um, spoken to a lot of individuals on law enforcement, spoken to a lot of individuals not on law enforcement, um, thought about um, the idea of what the definition of independence is. I've heard, you know, Rachel said her version of what her independence means. We all have different definitions of what that might look like. Um, I I understand and absolutely value the perspective of an individual with lived experience who has been a former police officer. I am very, I am reluctant to continue with, um, with to, to move forward with changing the language at this time. Um, I know that that's probably very disappointing for um, some folks to hear, but I have put so much thought into this particular question and this has to be an independent board. And whether it be for optics of our community whether it be for, um, I mean, building, I mean, I understand that that sworn police are um, police officers, retired police officers are members of our community. We have what, 42 other commissions in our city that they can serve on, including the Fire and Police Commission to be able to take part in these types of things um, in the city. Um, I, I am reluctant to move forward with changing it. Um, I am, however, on the same page with Serafina is, I am very excited to hear from the community about this. And should the community come back and say, no, we want that, we wanna change this, then I will listen to that and I am open to that. Um, but this is where I am right now. Thank you. Thank you, Louisa. Rachel? I just wanna say, I'm, I'm really appreciating this conversation because I'm, I'm roller coastering on my own <laughs> thoughts on this. Like it's, this is hard. Um, so I, Something Louisa said just really made me think. Like, I agree. Like, this is a point we need. To, we need more information. We need more from our community and our the stakeholders on this, right? So, for me, thinking about changing the language is about, right? Like, and maybe I don't know if this is appropriate to ask Cami her opinion as like <laughs> a facilitator. But like, what we put out there in this document is either going to open doors to a conversation or like close them off. Right. So if the language in this section is so precise or so direct without nuances, is that going to like stop the facilitators from being able to to, you know, guide a conversation around it in the focus groups? Or is it going to be too black and white in a survey 
Like what, it, what is, if, if we're all agreeing, we wanna hear more, like what is the best language to use in this document to mm -hmm. allow space for that conversation? Well, I mean, I think that the draft recommendations are, they are this commission's attempt to come up with the, the first approved draft. I think what'll be important is that you allow those in the community that you're talking to, to understand that there are options outside of what you have written in your first draft. Um, so, because what's here right now, there's, there's no wiggle room. It is a no. And so if you want them to have feedback or give feedback on this, you're gonna have to help them understand that there are other options and what those look like. And that also remember when something is very kind of narrow in scope in this document, that if, that, that if you present it to the, the public and they're like, yeah, this is what we want, then there's no wiggle room for you either after that. And I, and I also, I do, um, I, at first I have to say, I really appreciate the thoughtful conversation that is happening here. Um, I don't always get to witness thoughtful conversations, particularly around subjects within recommendations that are clearly, people have two very differing opinions on this, actually more than two. Um, but I, I do think that um, it, it's important for you to just realize that you guys have also had, um, by the time the public will have seen this, you will have been learning about this for a year. And they will have the benefit of a small educational piece or short educational piece to try to understand all of this very quickly. So you also need to understand how much weight to give all of the opinions that you're gonna get when they have less information than you did when you came to your conclusion. Louisa? Do you have, given that what you just said, and given that you're saying that this closes doors in, an, in the way you know we've written it um, and the way we might get feedback, do you have a, a recommendation of what something could look like that we could think about as a group? Um, well, let me say, I, I have recommendations that I could give you. I can tell you how other cities have approached it in their final ordinance language. I do wanna make very clear that it's important to me that this is your document and not mine. So, um, so I'm, I mean, there are civilian oversight entities who have excluded all previous law enforcement. There are those that have, they do very similar to what Gabe had talked about. Madison is a good example where they exclude anyone who is, hasn't been retired. You have to have been retired, I think for 10 years before you can serve. Um, and you can't have served, I think in Dane County, which is Madison's County. Um, and then there are some that kind of come in in between where they say, you, you know, and there, there are also, and this is not something that NACL prescribes as an effective practice. There are, I served on a board with sworn law enforcement. I mean, like 20 years ago, but, um, but I, I did. And um, so there are different ways to handle it. So before I go on, Christian. Um. I'm sorry to be the time uh, curmudgeon over here, but um, we've had this conversation a lot. I think it's a great conversation. I, I would love for us to move to a straw poll uh, because I haven't seen a lot of people change their their votes from the previous vote in the interest of time, because at this rate, we won't even get to where we left off at the last meeting. 
Thank you, Christian. And that I, I hear what you're saying. I am gonna um, let Jordan speak because he's not been a part of this conversation yet. Um, um, I, I thank you and thank you, Christian. I do uh, agree that we, you know, time is of the essence. And I wanna thank everybody for this conversation. Um, this has been also something that I've been thinking and mulling over. Um, and for me, it, it still doesn't sit right um, to <laughs> have a member uh, from law enforcement on this, on this, this board. Um, and to take it the next step further, it also doesn't sit right for anybody from this Community Formation Commission to then turn around and apply to try and get on this board. So maybe there's a, a medium to also say, no one from the CFC shall be appointed to this board because it, to me, it's a conflict of interest if we're setting up a commission that to turn around and then apply to be on it seems not right. Um, so maybe that's a balance there to show, I don't know. That's just an idea, um, but that's, yeah, my two cents. Thank you, Jordan. Appreciate that. Gabe, um, I will um, leave it to you for the procedural aspect of this. Um, so let's go to a straw poll vote. The straw poll vote will be on whether to keep the language as written or to change it to allow uh, people who have lived experience of being a law enforcement officer, and we can figure out what that looks like in terms of parameters, but keep it the same or um, change it to retired law enforcement. Um, and the way that we'll do it is if it's keep it the same, raise your hand now. I'm not able to raise my hand, but I'm raising my hand. And this is Vice Chair Cabrillo. Thank you. One, that's six. And I believe there would be five of us with our hands down. So um, six voted to keep it the same. So we will keep it the same and we will move on. Thank you all for a very thoughtful conversation. I really appreciate it. Thank you, everyone. I appreciate it as well. And I think that it helps also inform the work of those working on the survey and the focus groups, knowing all of the things that have been said here tonight. So I think it was really valuable, um, even though <laughs> we ended up in the exact same place. Um, I appreciate it. Okay, so let's move on quickly to appointment of terms and members. Um, I'm, I'm not sure. So the few things about language we wanted to change, can to shall, um, kind of tighten it up by using the word ensuring. The rest of it, um, this is another section where we had a long conversation about um, consecutive terms. Um, and, um, oh, I'm sorry. I'm reading it and I'm in the wrong place. I apologize. Um, I think that this is all good. I just made those changes to there. I'm sorry for the confusion. Okay. Now on to the reappointment process, I'm sorry. Uh, the, in the reappointment process, there was a lot of discussion surrounding whether or pe not people should serve, be allowed to serve two or three consecutive terms. And the last, just as a reminder, that had been talked about bringing that also as something that would be talked about with the community um, through the survey and the focus groups. I did um, make the change regarding that, um, essentially that even regardless of consecutive terms, just some language that made it clear that it was based, that they would still have to be approved by council to serve more than one term. So is everyone still okay with moving forward with kind of leaving this as is and, and taking it to um, the survey and focus groups to kind of talk more about consecutive terms? Okay. 
seeing some nods, so I'm gonna move on, thank you. Okay, the next section um, where we had suggested changes had to do with training. Um, and there, there were several suggestions, and when I got in there to do some work, some of them were contradictory. <laughs> so I settled on training may include, but not be limited to, and did the listing. There were some notes that I had about making certain trainings mandatory, but there was no consensus on which trainings would be mandatory and which wouldn't. Um, one of the discussions that I think has been had that I think is worth maybe talking a little bit about here is that, you know, when this gets into the phase where these recommendations are turned into um, ordinance language, that there probably will be the opportunity to make some of these mandatory or, um, or to keep the, limit, the language very similar. Um, and that something to consider is that members or subgroup of this commission continues to be involved through that process to make sure that the voice of those who made the original recommendations are, are still involved um, and heard when there are questions and as the language is being written. Um, I think that that's something that, that should be considered. And that also means that you may not be able to decide on the exact mandatory training you want now, but um, that you can be part of those conversations going forward. Does anybody have any comments on this? Lizzie? Um, I just wanted to share that in, in the um, survey drafting group, we discussed having a question or leaving, leaving um, uh, or having, yeah, just allowing the community, um, the focus groups to um, maybe explore or brainstorm if they felt like there were certain areas that of training that should be mandatory. So um, I, I really like that. Uh, we, we have our own, you know, 12 person opinion, but I think it would be great to, to leave this part, the mandatory portion up to community feedback and focus group feedback. Thank you for that, Lizzie. Rachel? Yeah, thanks for that, Lizzie. I, I think ju just to um, put this out there again in agreement, um, the, the new focus group working group has already looked at some of these sections um, and I know we'll be presenting sort of those final uh, questions to the commission for discussion, um, hopefully relatively soon. Um, but, you know, I, I agree. I think this is a section where, um, you know, we've already talked about ways to like get, get the community kind of look at this list and really leave that conversation really open to get more feedback on mandatory versus voluntary and what, what appears to be more or less valuable. So, um, yeah, I think we're going to get a lot from the, the survey and the focus groups on this piece. Thank you, Rachel. Jordan? Um, I agree with the met first, uh, what was mentioned. I just recognize that this is the first time that we mentioned director of police oversight, I think, in this document. And for me, as I was reading it, I was like, okay, wait, where is this, where does this role? Can there be a little bit more explanation about it? Um, later on, we talk about it's an auditor monitor. And so I think we need to take a moment to just pause here and say, oh, this is our first mention of it. This is what we're thinking in terms of the office of police oversight. Um, and hopefully uh, go into more detail, uh, just more understanding um, in, in this. That, that would be helpful. Thank you for that, Jordan. It's a great point. And there's probably some language in the, the draft of the auditor monitor piece that talks about the, the DPO much more specifically that we can um, move over here as well so that it mirrors each other. Lizzie? Um, I just wanted to um, just comment on this. I am sensitive to the comments about um, worrying or about disappointing um, folks with a, a decision or uh, an opinion. 
and, um, and feeling maybe like their participation makes other people uncomfortable. And I just want to remind the commission that, you know, we were appointed by city council because of our unique perspectives. And we're all working really hard and spending a lot of time on this. So I just want to encourage um, us to continue to, to offer our honest opinions and, and really not worry about disappointing or, um, or whether or not we really have a, a space, a valid space, a place in this, in this um, conversation. I think we're doing a great job. And as we move forward with difficult conversations, I just, I just want folks to know that we want to hear all of all everyone's opinions. Thank you, Lizzie. Thanks for adding that. Any, anything else on this section? Okay, I'm going to move forward. Um, one thing I do want to bring up is so there were the, there's been quest, uh, language or conversations throughout about the ride along piece. And so one of the things that we um, that I added here was ride alongs or other equivalent immersive experiences so that it so that there it kind of opens up that space a little bit that it would still have to be something that really helped them understand the work of uh, uh, the, the kind of the daily work of um, policing in Santa Barbara, but um, that it kind of opened up the options there. So I just want to make sure everybody was okay with that because that is something we have talked about a lot. Christian? Personally, I like the way that it's worded in the previous one. I feel like ride-alongs, walk-alongs, practical experience wherever possible <clears throat> covers it, but I don't have really strong feelings about this one either way. Okay. Thank you for thank you for saying that, Christian. Anybody else? Do people feel like it? Oh, Louisa. Um, I actually prefer um, the equivalent immersive experience because that's the idea of ride-alongs is that it is immersive, and if there are other opportunities that could replace that, if people don't feel comfortable, I would I would like that. So, I think that's a better fit, to be honest. Thank you, Louisa. Anybody else? Rachel. Yeah, I, I like immersive experience. Um, also, because I'm I'm just thinking still of like focus group conversations and survey groups, you know, if we are using similar language, like lived experience, you know, oh, oh, um, the community that have some of the shared language, I guess, that we're using. So I, I like that change. Okay. Anybody else want to add to that? Okay, so from those I've heard from, which is not many of you, um, I, I realize, but I'm gonna keep the change for now. And if people have strong opinions later, the good news is this is still a draft, even when you approve it this first time. So we can always change it if needed, so. Okay, the other change that was made here is to add um, and de-escalation practices, which I think is a great addition to this list. Okay. One, one thing. Yeah. Jeremy, in terms of the position director of police oversight, mm -hmm. I just want a point of clarification. This position, the terms of members does not apply to this position. And I think that's something that we should be very clear about because this position could potentially be a former police officer. Correct? Yes. So I just think there are other opportunities where you know, police officers can be a part of the process. Great point. Thank you, Jordan. Okay. So moving on to duties and authorities, and I'm sorry, Sean and John, I have not asked recently if you have anything to add. I want to make sure that I have not. Uh, not yet, Cammie. Okay. <laughs> Coming up though. Well. Okay. <laughs> No, but okay. thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Okay, so the next um, on duties and authorities. So um, 
so I will say, so there was the conversation about changing the number of days for responding to recommendations. And um, I think that there could possibly be some room from additional, because I additional um, clarity or yeah, clarity here, because by responding, we're not talking about implementing um, recommendations. We're just talking about this response. Yes, agree, no, um, and, and why. Um, and there was some conversation about 60 days. There was a conversation about 45 days. And I will say this language um, that I put in here, knowing that there needed to be a change, actually um, came about because of a discussion in um, one of the working groups uh, when we were putting together the auditor language that you will see at the next meeting. And this is what is in there. And so I wanted to kind of throw this out here to see what you felt um, the recommendation is would be that um, the chief would re uh, respond to recommendations in writing no more than 45 business days from the delivery of the recommendations within additional 30 days when needed and upon a request. Any any feedback on that? Christian? Um, I would love to hear from representatives of the SBPD uh, because this seemed to be a sticking point uh, for y'all in the last meeting. Um, I do think it's important that we have uh, recommendate in the, in the recommendations an outline for uh, like a speedy, and I, I think 45 is speedy enough, um, uh, reply to recommendations put forth by the, the future uh, police oversight board because it establishes the expectation that the work that they're doing is going to be responded to by the police in writing in an official capacity that is, uh, uh, public facing. So I think 45 days is a great compromise. I'd love to hear what the Santa Barbara Police Department representatives think about that. Thank you, Christian. Chief or? Um... Yeah, um, I appreciate the, uh, the change. I, th I think I expressed the last time that I thought 30 was a little tight. One of the, um, uh, one of the examples I gave is, for example, in this this year's legislation, there were uh, probably somewhere in the neighborhood of 25 significant law changes, all of which are going to result in in modifications to department policy. And so sometimes the turnaround may not be instantaneous. If the purpose of the language is to say that uh, the police chief will, um, you know, will one acknowledge that it came and hopefully respond to the recommendations directly rather than, you know, playing, uh, you know, some kind of semantic ping pong, uh, which I, you know, is not the intention. I, I personally have no problems with the way this is written. Right. Thank you for that. Appreciate it, Chief. Any other comments on this? Great. Okay, the next piece was involvement in the hiring, evaluation, and firing of the Director of Police Oversight. So we essentially took two sections and combined them into one um, in, in this section. Jordan? Yeah, so I just wanted to, this is uh, another consistency. Like I see that we have director of police oversight, auditor monitor in parentheses, and then sometimes we use auditor monitor, and then sometimes we use director of um, police oversight. So I think we either use one or the other, or maybe both just to be consistent. I would recommend both um, just because as I was reading, I was like, wait, but you mean this position as well. So just for clarification, mm -hmm. I think that would be of help. Okay. Um, just really quick, I agree. Um, I think if and when we ever get to the discussion and review of the auditor monitor draft, uh, that would be a great time to discuss that. But uh, we really got to get to that portion of the meeting uh, 
before we can uh, make those kind of determinations because we haven't even as a full commission discussed that yet. Thank you, Christian. Gabe? Well, I was just going to comment that um, we will get to the auditor monitor language. It's likely going to be next week. Um, they're really close and we appreciate mm -hmm. all of their hard work. Uh, I think what I, I like Jordan's uh, point of adding the auditor monitor next to director of police oversight where it's listed. It, it provides a lot of good context that will mm -hmm. blend really well into the next uh, portion of the recommendation. Okay. Great. Thank you. Okay. Then if there are no other comments on that section, I'm going to move down to number three, request data related to the SVPD um, pattern and practice. Um, I did add some language for clarification about um, the type of data that's collected and that it's data that's relevant to um, uh, fulfilling the civilian oversight mechanisms, powers and duties. Um, I think reading it now, I think probably we could work on that language just a little bit more to, to fine tune it, but I do think um, the sentiment is there. And then I also added the word inaccessible um, to make sure that um, whatever is being presented during the public COB meeting is accessible to all community members. Any comments on this? Okay. Christian? Sorry, just one quick one. It seems uh, to be like a redundant use of the word relevant. Um, where I feel like we could just say like, or information relevant to fulfilling the civilian oversight mechanisms, powers and duties. Okay, I can I can take one of those relevance out for sure and, and fine tune that. Thank you for that. Okay, anything else? Lizzie? Um, so reading where, um, the data shall be presented during a public COB meeting. Does that restrict um, conversation between uh, police and this position? Because I'm thinking if we're doing analysis, um, could they, that, I'm just wondering if that part right there, the data shall be presented during public COB meeting, if that is too restrictive. Chief, I see your hand raised. Just a reminder, and I should have thought of it three minutes ago, but there is there are some circumstances and it's laid out in another part of the document. There are certain things that would be uh, discussed in closed session mm -hmm. uh, re re required by re required by law, and presumably some of that data would be there. So I would look at John, but uh, that last that last sentence could be problematic or at least appear to contradict. The acknowledgement that there are there are things that would be discussed in closed session, and therefore, by definition, not immediately accessible to the public. Thank you for that, Chief. And it may be I know that in another section of the document we've um, made reference to when it is um, allowable by, by law. Um, to be presented publicly. And I think that we could probably, um, uh, w when John has uh, his time with this document <laughs> to um, make sure that everything lines up legally, I think that we can probably add some language in there. I'll, I'll make a comment there as well. But I think that's a really good point. And I would uh, commission, I would echo the chief's sentiments that, you know, at least the language went allowable by law. You know, there's limited circumstances when you can have items in closed sessions. You know, um, the common ones are uh, uh, discussing threat of litigation, uh, real estate transactions. So not these two won't, but the main one would be personnel issues. So it's usually the, uh, the uh, evaluation, the discipline or the hiring of an employee. 
uh, anything outside of that really can't be held in closed session and deals with employees. So for example, civil service commission will go into closed session, deliberate in a hearing and evaluate to decide and determine to uphold or to uh, not uphold discipline. That's why that could be proper. Uh, you know, if we're talking about an evaluation of a situation and the personnel records being reviewed, you know, that, that's why those issues would have to be held in closed session. Thank you, John. I appreciate that. Okay. So next, the review of the complaint um, process language was added in here um, regarding, um, and this language is taken also, this is, this also mimics the language that you will see eventually in the, the auditor monitor uh, draft. Um, in collaboration with the OPO and the city attorney's office, the COB shall, based on, ba shall, based on current established effective over civilian oversight practices, assist in the creation of a process for receiving and investigating complaints from community members regarding the SBPD. The process shall allow for multiple options for filing, processing, and forwarding on to SBD for investigation in a timely manner. Um, I know that there is, um, there is, were some questions around that piece that uh, like timing. Um, and I do think timing is as important here as it is in other parts of the documents where we spelled it out. Um, and uh, because matters of complaint are, um, uh, and I've had some great conversations with people about this, the, the, the timeliness, the forwarding a complaint that's received is important not only to um, it can be very sensitive on the law enforcement side of it. There may be an officer that needs to be removed, but it's also really important because you have a community member who's filed a complaint and wants to see it handled expeditiously. So the, every everybody on every side wants this to happen quickly. And sometimes there's also legal matters that require it to be handled very quickly. So, so I added timely manner. Um, I think if anybody else wants to come on, comment on that, please let me know if there's additional language you want to see there. But this um, is definitely an expansion of what was there before to be a little bit more specific. Any, any comments? Well, I'm gonna, I am going to run to the next section then. Uh, um, John or Sean, any comments from you? I don't, I don't wanna run that fast. No, not for me. Uh, okay, great. Thank you. Um, and then, oh, and then later on, I also added language that, that um, ongoing reviews of the effectiveness of the com current complaint process will be put into place just to make sure there doesn't need to be changes to make it more effective. Um, the last section that we talked about at our last meeting was closed session. And now we move into what we have not discussed before. I will say that um, based on some conversations, there some of this language is very slightly different to the last version that you had, only for, as I was reading through it, for some clarification, but it's essentially the same, same document. So um, the first one, issuing subpoenas, um, any comments on this? If there's no comment for the commission, I, I do, but I'll wait for the commission first. Okay. Rachel? You we can't hear you, you, Rachel. Oh no, still can't hear you. We still cannot hear you, Rachel, sorry.
So while we wait for Rachel's um, sound to come back on, does anybody have any additional or have any comments? Um, I'll jump in really quick, Cami. I would just say um, this language is present in a lot of the uh, in a lot of the ordinances that I've reviewed, um, and I think it's an important one to allow the the board to to do the work of uh, oversight. Thank you, Christian. Lizzie. Hi, and I just wanted to share with the commission that um, our next meeting, when we do review the um, auditor monitor, there there are guidelines as to when an investigation will um, be initiated. Oh, great point, Lizzie. And I think one thing that we've tried to do in the auditor monitor review, I'm sorry, auditor monitor draft, is when there are things like this that talk about the independent investigation, we have put C section in parentheses next to it so people know that where to go to understand the independent investigation piece. Um, since it is, according to your original um, recommendations, very specific as to when that can actually happen. Um, Gabe? So uh, Rachel's having some internet issues, but she can hear us. She's just having trouble when she uses her oh. mic. Um, so she let me know what her question was. Her question was, and this is gonna be for you, uh, John, is for other commissions that have subpoena authority, what is the process for that body to use uh, their subpoena authority? And even if they haven't used it in the past, we're curious about what the process is if they wanted to use it in the future. Yeah, absolutely, got it. Chair Escobedo, Commission, and uh, Commissioner Johnson kind of raised my mind because I, I read my mind because kind of that's what I wanted to kind of uh, elaborate on is um, the, the process and maybe a need for specificity about the subpoena power and, and, and some of the issues. So let me address first that there's two commissions in the city that have subpoena power. Um, and it's a fire and police commission and a civil service commission. And it's, it's interesting because there are other commissions that hold different hearings. Uh, one common one is a planning commission, you know, Pelham's bring, um, you know, cases before that on, on, our, on our property issue uh, before it. But um, the only two that really do have subpoena power are those two. And, and, and we haven't had to use it in fire and police. We have used it in civil service commission. And here's a situation where you have it. When you have a hearing, so it's for a hearing. So let's say there's an appeal for a, uh, an employment decision, a termination or sus suspension. Um, and you want to have witnesses attend, you require them to compel them to attend the hearing. Uh, and they're not city employees, they're third party witnesses. They could be, um, they, they could be at a, a, observers at, at a restaurant or, or other from a different city or something. And you wanna compel their, their testimony to attend the hearing like you would in a court uh, a proceeding. Uh, what we do is we would issue a, a subpoena. Uh, the commission would give the authority, sign it. Uh, our office, city attorneys, would prepare the subpoena. The city clerk's office would issue it, but it'd be under the authority of the commission. So it means that the commission agrees to issue the subpoena. Um, the city attorney's office prepares a, a, a legal subpoena, and the clerk's office would help issue it. Uh, and we would send a server process server like anyone else to, to, to serve the subpoena on the person. Failure to comply with the subpoena would be like any other subpoena would be a misdemeanor. Uh, and then to enforce the subpoena, if someone wouldn't attend, we would actually have to go to superior court to get a judge to enforce that subpoena. Um, and uh, we never had to go that route. We have had in the past had to go for legislative subpoenas issued by the city council, a short-term vacation rental, some people didn't comply to a production document, um, we, we would have to issue, um, we would have to go to city council. Uh, they didn't, city council, the mayor issued request for legislative subpoena, the party didn't comply. So we went to a judge in Santa Barbara to enforce, make them compel uh, to produce the documents we requested. Uh, and so th that would be the body to the court, our local court would be the body to enforce our subpoena. Now, the interesting thing is the question is, um, the subpoenas have always been used for third parties. Usually when you're, if you're compelling 
uh, if you're requesting for something for the city department or city employees to appear, uh, that that would be different. A subpoena wouldn't be not, not necessarily necessary, right? We can make it a requirement that uh, in the rules, the bylaws, or the ordinance that um, city employees, uh, et cetera, must comply to requests or attendance from the commission and such being would be considered in subordination. Um, you know, th that would be uh, a way to go about it. It would make it less complicated and wouldn't be a need for a subpoena. So we really see the need or use for subpoena what we always have is um, things the city doesn't have control of, third parties, non-city employees, non-city departments or entities. That's where we've needed subpoenas to secure either a person's production of documents or, or their testimony. Um, you know, now with that, again, we need the specificity, uh, you know, when would we compel testimony in front of a commission? If they're not deciding a hearing, you know, what, what would that be? Or would it be to compel uh, documents for the investigator, right? So, you know, that, that's where we need a little more specificity. But if you're looking to get city cooperation, you, we would just automatically make that a requirement. So this is more for third party outside uh, things. And that's what we've used it in the past, process being um, someone the city doesn't have control over, uh, a non-city employee or entity. Uh, and so uh, the process would be the city attorney's office would prepare it, uh, serve it on the individual. And then if we wouldn't get compliance, we would have to go to court to file a motion to compel. I hope that answers the question. Any other follow-up questions? I'm uh, available for that. That's incredibly helpful, John. Thank you, Gabe. That is really, really helpful. Thank you, John. A uh, couple follow-up questions. The first, I think it we can all assume, but it's always nice to hear. As it goes through the city attorney's office, the city attorney is evaluating whether or not the subpoena request is legal. Is that correct? Correct. Part of that part of that process is, would, would be that. Is, is it a lawful subpoena that, that is being issued? Because can it be enforced, right? Because like, let's say a person ignores it and uh, we have to go to court, you would have to have at least uh, a legal basis to uh, defend it in front of a judge. Thank you for that. And then a uh, second follow-up question, John, is if this oversight agency was to contract with an independent or outside investigator, would that investigator be considered as a part of that requirement under or um, for city employees to provide testimony and documents? So uh, there wouldn't be a need. Well, not to say that there wouldn't be a need, but uh, if the independent investigator requested testimony or documents, city employees would be required to present that. Um, yes. Yeah. So if it's a city employee, they're required to participate that if we created that in the rules. Um, and if it's a contractor, which is a city employee, uh, that could be a term in the contract. Otherwise, it would be in breach of that they would, you know, agree to any appearances, requirements, uh, et cetera, as deemed necessary by, by the commission. So, um, so it can be handled. It can be handled either way. What's interesting is, um, uh, I'll give it, you know, and, and, com and compelling attendance is important. So I'll give an example of the Civil Service Commission. So um, usually a person doesn't have to, at least a criminal court, testify, right? But if a, if a person rings, if an employee appeals to the Civil Service Commission, um, even if they don't want to be, let's say their own lawyer doesn't want to call them as a witness in, in their appeal, uh, the city who's uh, defending the case, in that case, a lot of times, it's me, I have a right to call that city employee whether they, they want to or not. And if they don't testify, then their appeal is considered basically, uh, uh, or, or don't appear at the hearing, they're, they, they basically void their, uh, their, their appeal process. Uh, so um, so usually, usually the, the, obviously the employee that's appealing doesn't need a subpoena. Uh, usually if, we, if I'm requiring witnesses, or the other side is requiring witnesses of city employees. We, we give them notification of when and where to attend uh, the, the hearing. 
and they're required to do so. We've only issued it for not for non city employees. And I, I think I worded my question weird so that um, let me take another chance at it and then I'll uh, open up space for others is if we were to hire an independent investigator for we'll lay out the process later when we go through the second part of the draft city employees would be required to provide documents and submit testimony for that independent investigator is that correct that same requirement would be there for the independent investigator yeah you could you could put that in, in the recommended rules and regulation then such failure to cooperate would be deemed insubordination you, you could you could do that um currently and i if, if uh, lieutenant hill wants to even elaborate that uh we require uh you know either the subject employees or witnesses to attend uh, interviews, right? And, and if we are requiring them to provide something, um, we request it, but a lot, a lot of times it's more interview-based. Uh, and, 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 and part of the notice is that failure to cooperate uh, could be deemed as a subordination, uh, which could lead to putative action. Was I able to answer your question, uh, Chair Scabetta? Yes, thank you. That was really, really helpful. Appreciate it. Thank you for that, John. Um, any additional comments from commissioners or Sean or Chief Lickin? Uh, thanks for asking, uh, Commission. I just want to acknowledge this is this can be a pretty uh, contentious conversation regarding subpoena power. I appreciate the thoughtfulness and the way this was crafted and uh, I, don't, I don't have any uh, response to it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. With no additional, oh, I'm sorry, Chief. Did you have something to say? So you pop on. I was only going to agree with Lieutenant Hill's comments. Thank you. Okay, next, let's move on to the next section, conducting community um, outreach. Give all of you a second to refresh your memories on this. And then I will open it up for any comments. Jordan. Thank you. I just wanted to know, I had notes here. Should we be explicit about Spanish translation or ASL or any other forms? Um, just wanted to have a quick moment on that. I, I could just chime in Jordan just by or just using the term terminology accessible using you know making that would be kind of more general. Is it do you think that it's enough Jordan and Louisa that we in number two that says ensuring that all communications are accessible to all members of the community is that taking that far enough do we need any additional language there. In terms of um, disability um, accessibility is the term we tend to use so okay. um, that would be okay in, in that perspective. Okay, that sounds uh, good to me. I just didn't know if we need to be explicit, but thank you. Okay, thank you, Jordan, for bringing that up. Christian? Well, I agree. I agree with Commissioner Kilbrew. I think maybe um, adding some language that says like included but not limited including but not limited to uh you know uh accessible language and uh i i don't know how to say it, like general accessibility right for for folks that may be uh you know blind or deaf or uh have other uh impairments so i'm just going to jump back back in I agree that there needs to be language, but using accessibility, I don't think you need to call out people who are blind or deaf specifically, because accessibility is a term that we use in the word in the in the advocacy world for disability. But language can be separate too. Okay.
Okay, thank you. Anything else? Okay, moving on to the next one, fostering a collaborative relationship um, with the SPD and other city departments, Lizzie. Uh, this is actually uh, the, about the one before in complaint okay. information to the monitor's office. I think would that be the COB or the okay. office of OPO, I think instead of monitor's yeah. office. Had that one too. <laughs> Definitely have some consistency issues in the document for sure. Okay, we'll work on this. Yeah, wait till we change the name, Cami, and then you're gonna have to go back and do it all over again. I was gonna say you can't, but <laughs> that's not true. You can. <laughs> um. Okay. Great. Thank you for that, Lizzie. Okay. Now let's move on to the next one fostering a collaborative relationship. Any comments on this one? Chief? I might look, I might look to John. I don't, I don't conceptually, I, there's you know, certainly no problem with this, but there are, there are some, um, there's some language that's that's not here that I've referenced that I've seen in other um, in other oversight boards about not uh, and I'm going to use the wrong verb infringing on city council city manager chiefs of police duties that are outlined by law mm -hmm. and so that the chief of police selection process well I would certainly support the idea that the the board has a role to play in that. Uh, I, I think I would I would look to the city attorney to make sure that the the process language was very clear and, and I wouldn't I, I certainly wouldn't make this uh, particularly specific. For example, the the specific requirement in the second section that there will be a representative on the board uh, or on on the interview panel. Interview panels are there's all kinds of panels with regards to the process. Um, so I would just, that, it's just a concern that I have about how that's worded. Okay. That's, that's a good question, Chief, uh, Chair Escobedo Commission, uh, Cami. The, uh, so the, the one conflict is this, the, the hiring decision of the, per the charter, hiring decision of the uh, police chief falls to the city administrator. Um, now it requires that uh, it be approved by um city council so in closed session so any any department and this includes any department head not just chief of police but could be the fire chief could be public works director so the process usually is that the city administrator would go into a closed session uh with uh recommended hiring you know why and then the uh city council would uh then approve that selection or, or agree to it and then it's announced later on an open in open session. Um, so the there's no automatic panel. I mean, we've used that process, right? So it's up to the city administrator to decide um, uh, how they wanna go about the selection process. You know, it, 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 uh, one city administrator could decide, you know, I just wanna, I don't want a panel, I don't want what I wanna do. Well, so when I want interviews, the city recruiter gives me the 10 best applications, right? I, you know, I'm not saying that's the process, but you know, that, that's up to the prerogative for the charter of how the uh, you know city administrator wants to at least go through the, the process, um, so so nothing could at least conflict. Now, the other, the other issue is of course the fire and police commission also has the same purview, right? That to, and it's advise or recommend, right? Uh, in terms of the hiring uh, of, of a fire chief and a police chief, so um, you. It, it, we're, we're looking to do two things. You'd, you'd want to at least look to at least um, mirror that language, right? So it's not in conflict, mm -hmm. at least uh, to recommend, right? Uh, the hiring of, of, a, of a police chief um, to, to the city administrator, right? That would be the, the process. Um, and, and the other issue, we will, 
obviously look to it as we, we get the final draft and, and do a further review is, and, and Ken, you kind of dealt with this issue. Madison is at least not in conflict with already the, the purview of a, um, of a, uh, uh, established commit charter commission, the fire and police, because I know the fire and police in Madison has some issues about um, their at least power of authority being mm -hmm. usurped by it. But it would at least be a baking uh, recommendation to the city administrator because that's who's really tasked with making the decision. And, um, you know, and, and we already have language, at least it's being able to make a recommendation, right? And so that's easier versus maybe sitting you know, on a panel, because, you know, if you have language so detailed like that, it's different city, 20 years from now, city administrator may decide to have a different process. And you can't force that city administrator to use a panel because they have the purview of how they want to go about deciding the, the selection process. So that's one of the issues, at least for this, you know, commission to, to consider. It may need to be more, a little bit more of a vague language of at least being able to make a, make a recommendation Right, and then the city administrator could decide how they how to use, um, the, the, you know, the commission in part of that process. Okay. Thank you for that, John. It's helpful. Um, Lizzie. Um, I like the idea of mirroring the fire and police commission language, um, but I'm also wondering if we can be a little bit more sort of active in the sense of um, provide the city administrator, city administrator with recommended qualities and qualifiers um, in the hiring of a police chief. And so, um, so, so that is kind of separate from sitting on an interview panel. It's, it's giving the city administrator a list of things that we, that the commission feels is important for the um, incoming police chief to, to hold. And that ends up being more of a responsibility of the commission to discuss that and develop those recommendations. I think, I think, I feel like that's more of an active role than, um, than maybe sitting on an interview panel. So, am Am I hearing from you, Lizzie, that essentially, well, and from you too, John, essentially the second point, the second section in this, because what, what you just said, Lizzie, and maybe I'm missing something, is really what's in the first section of this, is uh, input on the job description, the, the, I mean, we could add more to that. Um, but what I'm saying is, so that it doesn't conflict with what the city administrator is doing. It's not necessarily the application process because I think usually they outsource the um, the the, um, the selection or like the the announcement of the of the position being available. What I'm talking about is, for example, the organization I was um, representing, Restorative Community Network. We um, before the previous chief was hired, we sent a letter with a list of folks' names who, who endorsed that letter saying we wanted the chief to have restorative practices, to follow 21st century policing, to have relationship with the community. So we had a list of qualifiers that we sent to the, um, to the city administrator. And I think if this commission is going to be representing the community, they should have an active um, uh, role in that. And that may mean seeking community input on what the community feels is important as well. Well, I could, uh, uh, Commissioner Rodriguez, uh, Chair Escobedo, uh, Cami and C Commission. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's an interesting point. The, the language in the um, section A15 of the city charter for the, uh, actually 816 for the city charter for the uh, police and fire commission, language says recommend to the city administrator and city council. So, so it includes both. And the reason why it includes both is because of the process I you know, explain where the city administrator kind of initial makes a, uh, a decision and then goes for the approval in closed session for the city council to, to approve that. Uh, and so it recommend to the city administrator and city council appointments to the offices of the fire chief and police chief, uh, chief of police. And um, you know, the, the, if, if you have it at least that way, 
and, and, and not too detailed, you know, that recommendation can take the form of any commission or body that, that wants, that, that they, they want. So, you know, you, you may have a commission that wants to do exactly what Commissioner Rodriguez has, and there may be a need for a panel. And then, you know, and, 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 and they may want to add to that or, or, or different things. So if, if you're going to make a recommendation, at least to, you know, the selection that includes the qualities or maybe in a particular candidate, um, you, you, you don't, what you don't want to do is be so detailed where you're boxing yourself in. Well, you know, and, and people for now, 30 years from now, looking at this and trying to interpret it. Nope, this, this is limitations because they just put this and this and this and they didn't include everything else. Uh, and, and so uh, at least you look at the language with the Fire and Police Commission have, and, and you know, they, they can utilize it any way that they see fit, right? There's really no limitation of, you know, they can write to the city council and, and city administrator uh, when they're going through this, these are the processes and qualities we want, or they can sit in an interview panel and decide on a particular candidate. So you want it, you don't want to have it uh, too limiting or, you know, the option is you have, you know, certain things you want in there in terms of that would then allow for, <laughs> you know, having more broad-based language or, or, you know, can do the following, including, and then be more specific, you know, but I, I personally like the idea of, you know, having language which we have in the current charter when it comes to that, because, you know, it, it, it can encompass a lot of things, right? And, and, and you don't want to limit input if that's the desire of this commission. I don't think it, uh, I think that is the desire of this commission. They want, they want to have input. So that, that form of recommendations or process can include all sorts of things, they include, you know, the, the qualities of the candidate to the candidate themselves. Thank you, John. Appreciate that. Um, Christian? Yeah, I think it's a great suggestion um, from Commissioner Rodriguez, and thanks for the added color on that, uh, Mr. Doimus. Um, if we could just have the staff um, provide the commission with a copy of that language um, so that we can better mirror, or at least the drafting subcommittee uh, and CAMI, uh, so we can, we can better mirror that and not be in conflict, that would be wonderful. Thank you. Not a problem. We'll, we'll provide the language um, from the charter. Thanks, John. Gabe? I was just going to suggest that after this item, we take a short break to give people the opportunity to stretch their legs and um, just take a break before we finish out. But I don't want to cut this discussion short, so just wanted to bring that up. Thank you, Gabe. Does anybody else have any additional comments on this section? Back to you, Gabe. All right. <laughs> so we're approaching two hours. Uh, let's take a short break and we'll call it seven minutes and we will come back at 7.30. Thank you. We're in recess. Thank you. Okay. We cannot hear you. Sorry, Rachel. Rachel, sometimes if you call in and then mute your computer, you'll be, you can, we can hear you. Um, I'll just say, I think it would be great if we could combine them. I feel like mitigate conflicts of interest is covered by the current city's current process. But I'd love to be corrected on that if, uh, if uh, any city staff have anything to say. 
Thank you, Christian. Uh, Commissioner uh, Alonzo, Chair Scabato, Commission. My understanding is that one is the contract um, uh, number um, uh, 11 is the con uh, number 10 is the contract out uh, any services uh, to fulfill requirements. Um, so, and usually that would coincide with being given a budget and then being able to um, use that budget to just uh, contract services as needed for the fiscal year. Uh, and I guess then 11 being, as Commissioner Alonzo was saying, part of that is to fulfill it is there may be a need to contract um, outside services, including if there's an issue about uh, um, a, a, an attorney or, or whatever it may be. So, um, yeah, I would view that as at least part of part of uh, 10, being able to um, contract services as needed, and that would include you know, um, hiring of services to prevent, to mitigate conflicts of interest. So I would agree with that. Thank you for that, John. Any additional comments? Okay, so let's move on to budget proposal approval. And during the break, I caught yet another uh, issue with the consistency of the OPO versus the DPO. Sean, I see your hand up. Uh, yeah, I was wondering, I, I wanted to just make a quick reflection on the previous section, if you could pull it back. Certainly. Um, I would just um, ask the commission for maybe a quick reflection on the, the wording of community's best interest. Perhaps there's more specificity that better relays the intent of that. Thank you. Lizzie? And that's a good point. And I think in the um, in previous sections, we we added something like um, in order for the COB to complete its duties, something along those lines. Okay. I was wondering if there would be support for adding language to say. Um, to avoid actual or perceived conflicts of interest. Any comments on that? I think that that might be good language as we combine these two, since we won't have the heading, I think that it will be important. So in order to um, avoid conflicts of interest. Thank you. Okay, anything else on that section before we move on to the budget piece? Okay, great. Okay, now on to the budget proposal approval. Any comments on this? Any staff comments? Okay. Hearing none, um, let's move on to section 13 on officer involved shootings. I'll give all of you a moment to read that. Gabe? I. Uh 
I know this is one I talked to John about, and I think it would be helpful if John weighed in on, I think there are some legal considerations for us to hear before we start discussing language. It's okay. Sure, Jessica, Chair Escobedo, um, uh, two things to consider. A lot of times officer involved shootings uh, are investigated by uh, a different agency, independent agency. So, for example, a district attorney's office would investigate that. And obviously, that's nothing that the commission has jurisdiction or control over uh, in terms of the district attorney's office, it's a county organization, a separate organization, a non city organization. Um, there also is a state law that was passed um, um, last year, became effective. Uh, so, it's effective now, but it's been a little bit over a year. Uh, January 2021, um, that requires the uh, uh, officer involved shootings of an unarmed individual to be investigated by um, the, uh, the Attorney General's office, which uh, has uh, state, which has passed that down to state, state prosecutors to investigate that. So those, those types of um, shootings have already, are already um, at least um, being done by a separate state agency, which we would have no, no control over. They're, they're done separately. Um, so um, I'm just saying this point to the recognition of the commission. A lot of times under the section, uh, it wouldn't be done with a uh, by the, by the police department, right? So if you have a shooting of an unarmed individual, that's going to be done by um, the state AG's office. And if you're attorney general's office, and if you uh, one that doesn't fit that criteria, it still may be done by uh, the district attorney's office. So um, um, that's not to say that the once there's a report issued, um, that that report can be shared. Usually, it's a publicly issued report on a shooting, and uh, that a police you could talk to about with the commissioner that report. But again. Mind you, that's findings made by the district attorney's office, not by by this department. Now there are there are shootings. The shootings are also investigated afterwards, administratively. Um, for example, for um, issues of misconduct that Sean or the police chief can can talk more and elaborate on uh, on that. Uh, that would be different. But uh, uh, if you're looking at whether a shooting is cleared or if there's any criminal charges brought against an officer, that's done by an outside agency. Thank you, John. <clears throat> Lizzie, do you mind if I ask the chief to go so we can finish getting kind of all of the information about this first? Okay, thank you, chief. Thank you very much. The, uh, the wording on this, I, I think is, um, is really well done and, and reflects, uh, I think a lot of thoughtfulness and it's very clear that uh, uh, the, the working group li listened to the legal concerns uh, that, that these uh, uh, kind of incidents uh, generate. The other thing I wanted to say, and I've said it from the beginning about you know, my view on, on the role of the commission is that the, these officer involved shooting incidents, particularly when they result in the death uh, of a human being, are, um, uh, they're tragic, they're incredibly emotional. And one of the things that's often lacking, and this is from, you know, speaking with my almost 50 years of doing this, uh, is that uh, all too often the public is not clear about what happened. Uh, and, and the police department is often stuck because of the legal things that John mentioned in not being able to say much until investigations are concluded. Uh, but I, but I, um, I, I really think that that what the the um, what the commission can do is provide a forum uh, for the community uh, to vent its concerns and and ask its questions and allow the police department a forum to explain uh, what happened. And I think the wording in this uh, really reflects that uh, that reality. So. I, I, I thank the working group for their effort on this. Thank you, Chief. If I may, Cammy, one thing, just the, the bill, just for the commission, if they're interested in, is, uh, uh, and it's effective July 1st, 2021. So that's the law currently was passed. Uh, it's uh, AB 1506. 
Yeah. Uh, and so I did say, I meant the California Department of Justice, who then assigns the Attorney General's office to investigate uh, such a shooting. So that's the uh, that's the state bill, AB 1506. And it deals with a certain classification of involved shootings, unarmed individuals. Um, those that are not, that are done usually by the district attorney's office. Thank you for the additional clarification, John. I appreciate that. Lizzie. Um, so I was wondering if we can clarify. Well, first, um, even simply having the commission say that an outside agency, a state agency, is investigating this case, um, having that communication to the public, I think, would serve a sense of um, transparency. So sometimes it's easy to hear something from a separate entity other than the police department because uh, a standard statement is it's currently investigated. We cannot comment while it's currently investigated. And that just sort of leaves people wondering what's, you know, what, what, the, what are some of the details or, or concerns? So just having that kind of report back would be nice. But I'm also wondering if we can clarify Officer involved shootings, does that mean um, just when uh, uh, an officer um, fires their weapon or is that if a, an individual, a, a civilian fires their weapon as well? So I'm wondering if we can clarify that part or if it needs to be clarified. And also, is it only if somebody has been injured or is it any, any exchange of, of, of uh, gunfire? Thanks for the question, Lizzie. Chief, you want to jump in? Sure. The it, it's one of those legal things. The, the answer, Lizzie, is it, it depends. Um, for example, if um, and, and John referred to it earlier, if if a person who is hit by police, generally the term OIS refers to when an officer fires their weapon. If someone fires a, a, at the officer and um, uh, and the officer doesn't return fire, which uh, which happens. That that's in a that's a, 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 cr a criminal investigation and doesn't carry any separate context with it. If the officer is injured or dies uh, without returning fire, certain things can happen. But that again is not generally regarded as an OIS. If the the, the state agency under the law that John referenced is involved when the person who's struck by gunfire was unarmed. And there's a very convoluted definition of what unarmed means. If the suspect was armed, then the state generally does not involve itself. The federal, federal district uh, Department of Justice may, um, but the DA's office is always in, in, involved in looking at these things. Um, but the state is involved only if the person was the suspect in this case was was unarmed. I don't know if that if I've clarified it or muddied the waters, but thanks for that. Any any additional questions for clarification or comments about the language? Um, yeah, I'll, I'll just jump in. Um, I agree. I agree that um, clarifying officer-involved shootings is appreciated. Um, also, uh, Cami, can you can you confirm? Is there any additional information on the next page, or is this uh, all of? Okay, that is it. Yeah, um, I was just wondering about so so. The, the, the way the language is written out, it sort of just assumes um, how the commission will be involved like in the first like 30, 60 or 90 days, like, but doesn't go into what the role of the commission will be um, for the life of this um, incident. Um, mm -hmm. it, it reads as if the commission is sort of like a PR arm that's going to, mm -hmm. in the immediate, um, serve as a communications branch for um, the police uh, office. And I mean, that's how it reads to me. So if that is not the intention, we might 
need to tweak the language a bit. Thanks for that comment, Kim. Any additional thoughts on that? Possible language suggestions for clarifying? Um, I would love to get your input and feedback, uh, Commissioner Kim Johnson, uh, if you wouldn't mind uh, working with the drafting subcommittee to put together language that expresses that intent. Uh, because I think that uh, your point is valid and we should look at the language. I just want to offer and say that I, I agree as well. It goes back to the beginning of this call when we were talking about promotion of SBPD, and I, I just completely wholeheartedly agree with um, Commissioner Kim Johnson. So thank you for sharing that. Great comments. Anything? Oh, Gabe, I'm sorry. No worries. Um, I was just going to add maybe if uh, there's support for it. Also, adding this immediately after is a good opportunity to field questions and concerns from the community. So, it could also provide a forum for community members to participate. Um, because I'm not so sure that they would otherwise have a voice in the process. So this could be an important point for the community to participate. Okay. Can you clarify a little bit what you mean by participate? Oh, are you, do you mean like having an opportunity to sort of process what's occurring or what do you mean by participate? Well, public comment's a useful medium so that there's dialogue going both ways because most of the time the communication only happens one way. You say the, the, the state DOJ is investigating and they might share some other details, but um, and that maybe the chief or um, Sean could correct me, but I'm not sure that the, there's a space for community members to ask questions, express concerns. And yeah, it happens over public comment, but it's an important space to provide for people. So I wonder if we want to clarify that to maybe um, to, participating, to participate in a listening form because there, there really wouldn't be dialogue if the answer is consistently it's being investigated. Right, but it would be a space for community members to express concerns. It doesn't mean that there would be necessarily a dialogue going back and forth on each of those. We hear it during public comment. Um, and you'll see it at city council meetings or at commission and board meetings. And it's important because then it gives the commissioners or board members an opportunity to raise some of those points and to ask some of those questions. And yeah, some of the, sometimes the questions will be, we can't discuss that topic, but um, a good medium to provide a space for uh, citizens to provide that feedback. Thank you for that, Gabe. Christian? Yeah, I wholeheartedly agree with the chair. Um, and I really like the way that the Boulder, Colorado ordinance uh, spells this out, which they say that the uh, Civilian Oversight Board may provide a forum to gather community concerns about incident specific police actions and may receive and forward complaint information to the office for processing. Thanks, Christian. Anybody else want to add to this conversation? Okay, we definitely have some a little bit of work to do on that section and we'll we'll add that Sean. Hi, uh, do you mind scrolling back down? I can't see. Oh, that. yeah, sorry. I just wanted to be responsive to what I believe um, Commissioner Arigas was referring to. 
And um, that is uh, officer involved shootings, oftentimes as with our agency uh, policy is reflective of the language of officer involved shootings and deaths. And I think that might address her concerns. I'm not sure, but I just want to offer that. Okay. Thank you for that, Sean, I appreciate it. Lucy, did that further address or answer your question? Great. Thank you. Anything else on this? Okay, let's move forward to stipends. So just as kind of a recap, this is suggesting um, that each board member receive a stipend of $100 for each regular and special board meeting attended and $20 per hour for each hour of training or community outreach event. With a uh, stipend paid may not exceed $400 per month. And that COB member stipends and totally monthly stipends paid may be adjusted from time to time by city council. Let's start with that first part of this, the, um, the first section of, of stipends. Lizzie? I'm just curious if there is a, um, a number that, um, that transitions from stipend to employee and, um, and 400 times 12 might end up being an employee, which then uh, precludes anybody from serving because employees can't serve on, on this commission. Thank you for so that. I Ms. wonder can, uh, if, if Attorney Doinis can clarify that. Sure, uh, Commissioner Rodriguez, uh, uh, Commission Chair Scobedo Commission. The uh, as long as we have, whether it be in an ordinance or a uh, that we designate that um, these are not uh, commissioners, are not employees, or the you know, other commissioners uh, will be fine. And, and you know, going up to a uh, hundred dollars a meeting, up not to exceed to four hundred is can you know a diminished, diminished amount when you look at it from a yearly standpoint that you wouldn't be designated uh, as such as an employee. So um, there's no magic number that would uh, do that, but that's a safe that's a safe number that you have um, at least recommended that I, I would it wouldn't raise a legal concern. Thank you for the clarification. Any other? Comments, questions, concerns about this section? Okay, let's move on to section two of this. Um, the city of Santa Barbara shall provide stipends for child or elder care um, during sanctioned meetings and activities of the review board. Um, and this would uh, be a reimbursement of up to $50 per, $50 per meeting for child elder care. Any comments or concerns? Jordan. I think my only concern is uh, is for the process um, that folks would have to go through. That's just my only um, red flag, um, just because I don't want that to be a hurdle for folks. Um, but, but I really appreciate this, uh, this offer offering. That's a great question. Is there examples of other commissions who provide this type of stipend um, already that we would be able to learn from their process? Uh, Kim, currently there's no commission that has a stipend for uh, reimbursement of childcare or anything. We, we do have, um, we do have commissions with stipends. I believe it's fifty dollars a meeting. Besides, this one is for like uh, the architectural board of review or signal family design board. Um, um, they do get a stipend. Uh, a lot of times we do that too because of the uh, technical expertise they bring to their to these meetings, their meetings. Um, but we don't have any for for that. Uh, and the one thing we have to, um, I understand, not complicating the process but there would need to at least be something in terms of uh, 
showing our reimbursement because one thing we, we can't do uh, is at least uh, when it comes to public money is uh, um, you know gift the public money we have to be aware of that so we there, there would be we wouldn't have to be complicated but there would have to be at least a some type of process process or reimbursement what city employees do is usually uh, go somewhere as you know invoices uh, I, and I know that may be more difficult in the situation and faces but invasive but that's at least the process that we do if we are uh, for example going to a conference and um, there's a stipend for a meal or this or that we would have to bring back invoices that's the only thing I could think of uh, at least analogous to the situation thank you for that I appreciate the additional information Serafina um, I think we had mentioned this many, many months ago, um, but for this section, I think we had said um, if a commissioner wants to decline their stipend that they would be able to, do we need to include that in here? Or if they don't want it or need it, do we not have to include that at all? Um, or how would that work? Thank you for bringing that up, Serafina. That is definitely a conversation I had forgotten about, but that we had, I do remember you having it. So what are you, what, what are thoughts on um, the need to include that language in here? I, I would assume that all commissioners have the ability to decline. Yeah. So it may be that it doesn't have to be in here for them to be able to do it, Lizzie. Yeah, I remember the conversation and I think it was extraordinary doing this. We said we don't have to include it in here because we it, it's just a, a practice we can do. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you, Lizzie. Um any so any additional comments on um the third part of this? members being reimbursed for reasonable expenses incurred. Lizzie? Can we maybe clarify what that is? Because it seems like if we're paying for attendance and we're paying for potential childcare and we're paying for some sort of training, um, what would that other reasonable expenses be? I would also like that clarified because I'm, I'm wondering for this, like um, if this, if we're still going to be meeting remotely or other commissions are meeting remotely, would that mean that this would cover like if somebody needed Wi-Fi paid for, if they needed um, mm -hmm. access to like a, a room, you know, like an office somewhere, if a city one wasn't available, a laptop, something to meet remotely. Um, so I would also like that clarified. So you bring up some really good points. I think when it was originally written, the language was talking about things like parking. Um, but I do think, I mean, so you all have the ability to clarify it. I mean, as you make the recommendations and what um, you feel like would be reasonable. Um, you, you could go down a, fairly large rabbit hole here. Um, so, uh, Gabe? Yeah, really good point. Um, one thing that I think is important to just say, doesn't mean this needs to be the top consideration, but a consideration is uh, what we are proposing in this section is drastically different than uh, the way that other boards and commissions operate. I worry um, by expanding it too much that it might spook city council and they might default to what we typically do. I think um, offering child and elder care is, I think that's high on my priority list of what makes it in the recommendation. Um, so a consideration to make, I think maybe a way of getting 
to the heart of um, what Serafina brought up is we can add a space where reasonable, reasonable accommodation should be made for those that need things like access to Wi-Fi. We can reimburse them for um, transportation costs to get to that, that facility. And so maybe that's how we define reasonable. Um, yeah, that, that would be my suggestion. Thank you, Gabe. Jordan? Uh, I, I agree with checking this reasonable expense uh, section. Perhaps it is to the discretion of the Office of um, Oversight or the director position. Um, so that way it's like, they are the ones that deciding what is reasonable. Um, if that adds more um, checks to it, um, I don't. I'm still trying to think through the, what the language could be, um, but I think that could help, perhaps. Thank you, Jordan. Christian. I just want to say, um, I just think that this is bold. Uh, to put in the recommendations. I don't think that it should be bold. I think that the fact that we don't offer child care or elder care on any of our other commissions is not in service to inclusivity on these boards by you know folks uh, with, with kids uh, or uh, with elderly parents. And I think that um, this is just great. It's a, it's, an, it's a great thing. And I hope that other boards emulate what we're trying to do here in the future. I will say, um, you know, as along the lines of uh, making this palatable from a budgetary perspective, I don't want to, I don't want to drag the conversation about the uh, composition number of members on the board back because we discussed that at length. But I will say, after reviewing, um, you know, the the draft with with other folks in the community, the number eleven stands out as a pretty big number. It's a it's a significantly larger board than any of the other commissions out there, uh, and uh, when we're trying to like balance doing this, you know, uh, different uh, type of reimbursement with uh, the budget, uh, which is inevitably where it's going to come to with the city council. Uh, I would just want us to think again about the the total size of the board and whether or not there's room to reduce it to like nine or seven people as opposed to 11. Um, but that's, I don't want to drag that conversation back, but I just maybe consider that for uh, further review. Thank you, Christian, for bringing those points up. Rich? Um, I wanted to say in terms of the this reasonable expenses line, I, I'm wondering if this could be something uh, similarly to what Jordan said that the the OPO can decide if they have a budget. Is there a, any way that in the OPO budget that they have funding for anything that may come up by this and is decided by the OPO? So um, th that that seems to make the most sense to me, um, rather than us trying to include every you know, idea that would be out there. Um, I think we'd leave it to who, whoever we're going to hire. Great, thank you for that, Rich. Serafina? I agree, I think that's a really good point. Um, I was just thinking about something similar to that of maybe adding some language saying that, you know, if there's a cost of, you know, a reasonable cost that impedes a commissioner's ability to carry out their duties, then the OPO use, can use their discretion to say, okay, or work with them to get resources, to get their needs met and get them the resources. Um, but I, I like that idea of just, you know, keeping it somewhat general and just saying the OPO can decide um, how to get a commissioner's needs met. Um, but yeah, I think just general, and, and it could be anything, um, that could be in the way of them doing their duties. Um, so, but yeah, I, I think keeping it general is probably the way to go. Thank you, Serafina. Oh, I also have one more thing. Um, I agree with you, Christian. I think this is 
it is kind of funny that this is bold to to give a stipend for child care. <laughs> Um, but I also think, too, that the stipend, and this is something maybe we can bring up to city council, is that, you know, the stipend is more because this is a newer board. Um, I think we all know that the rise of cost of living and just expenses in general is skyrocketing, especially in California and even more so in Santa Barbara. Um, so I think that's a point that we could bring up to council if they're concerned about the budget of, like, you know, it. It is more than maybe what other um, commissions have, but it's also a newer board. And I think we could just say we're trying to keep up with the times um, and the changing costs of living in California. Thank you for those comments, Serafina. Lizzie? You know what? I'm going to save that comment. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> okay. Okay. Any, anything else on this section from commissioners or from uh, you, John or Sean? Okay. So let's move on to our next section, which is the Santa Barbara Police Department liaison. Um, so let me, so this, this right here, I can't, let me see if I can, get more of it on the screen at once. With you maybe still being able to read it. Can you guys even still read that? No, I can barely read it and it's on my screen. Okay, so let's start there. Let's work on the uh, first few. There's six total to this section. So any comments? Okay, Gabe. I was just gonna ask uh, for the opinion of Chief Malekian and Sean. Thanks, Gabe. Yeah, I don't, I'm, I'm supportive of, of this. I think one of, the, one of the challenges for the department is gonna be, I mean, you're aware that Sean, Lieutenant Hill has been your liaison and and what you may or may not be aware of is that that was not a new position that was created. Uh, he was removed from existing duties and it is it's not had an insignificant impact. Um, so at, at whatever point we we have this discussion, uh, I, I'm hopefully going to advocate for uh, uh, that that position become uh, a permanent one within the police department's table of organization because right now it's really it's really um, extra work but conceptually i i support the concept great thank you chief anyone else want to um, chime in Okay. That's it <laughs> for this. So, oh my gosh, you guys have to feel so good. Wait, hold on just one second. Um, did we review? So we were looking at the first four on the screen. Oh, well, I moved, I moved down to the other ones. Does anybody have any comments on the ones that they may not have seen? Okay, now you're really done. Now we can celebrate. Yes, so there are a few things, changes and adjustments that need to be made to this document based on the conversation today. So um, I will work with the drafting group for this particular document so that we can get those to all of you um, prior, well in advance of the next meeting. Because my hope would be 
that people can look at all of those and know any problems or concerns or questions they might have ahead of time so we can go through that very quickly um, at the next meeting. Um, really, I think although some of the conversations we had were fairly in depth on some of these topics, I think that the solutions um, will be, um, we're not gonna have to do any major rewrites. We're just adding language here and there, so. Um, so unless anybody else has anything about that or any questions about the process going for the, for, forward, I will turn it back over to you, Gabe. Yeah, I just wanted to start by saying thank you, Cami, and thank you to you all for just like a really great conversation. I don't think we would have been able to make this much progress without you, Cami, so thank you so much. Um, it is an absolute pleasure to work with all of you, so thank you. And thank you to the commission for a really thoughtful conversations. I know mm -hmm. Lizzie has highlighted this quite a few times, but it's really impressive that we can have these tough conversations and come out on the other end okay. Um, so with that, uh, Sam, if you could open up public comment, that would be great if we have anyone that would like to give public comment. Sure, give me one second. If there's anyone in the public that would like to speak on item five, the discussion and review of civilian oversight board draft language for the oversight model, please click on the hand raise feature. If there's anyone that would like to speak on item five, there's one hand raise, give me one second. Okay, I believe you are ready to go. Hello. Um, I think my question is just more general. Uh, I'm a little confused on what the hybrid model is putting in. My assumption was that it would be two of the three models, but I feel like um, you guys have only talked about the audit and monitor one. So what exactly would the hybrid model be? Thank you, that's all. Okay. Thank you for that public comment, Sam. Um, do you, no, we have any other public comments here? There are no other, no other hands raised. Thank you. Cami, for that question, can you um, provide a little bit of context about where we're at in the process and uh, more about the hybrid model and what we'll be discussing next week. Absolutely. So the um, the the commenter um, Lydia you made a good point in that um, what they have discussed this evening is just one part of the total recommendation. So the um, commission has already made the decision to recommend a hybrid agency, which will include a review component and an auditor monitor component. Um, tonight, we just did the review component and at the next public meeting, they will be discussing the recommendations that are specific to the auditor monitor. So that's, that's why we're only, we've only finished the one piece and, and the rest is coming. So um, next week you'll be able to um, hear more about those recommendations and, and see um, some of the draft work prior to the meeting as well that will be posted. Thank you for that, Kimmy. Mm -hmm. Really appreciate it. And for any other questions or concerns, you can email, uh, we have a CFC specific email. Um, it's cfc at santabarbaraca.gov. So if you have any other questions, concerns, you'd like to, uh, clarification, you can email us at cfc at santabarbaraca.gov. And with that, uh, we will close out this item and we are going to skip item six, which is what we will tackle next week. It's the discussion and review of auditor monitor draft language for the oversight model. Um, we will move on to item seven, future business. Uh, 
nothing really to report except that we're going to go over the auditor monitor draft language and I believe it should be ready shortly to be sent out to the full commission so you'll have it well ahead of time to review. So please, uh, when you do get a chance and when you receive it, please do take the time to review it before next week's meeting. And unless there are any other updates that people would like to throw into future business, I think we can adjourn the meeting. So thank you all again. We will adjourn the meeting at 8.18. We're making some real progress. Um, looking forward to it. Good night, everybody. Good night.